Have you ever bought fabric on a whim and then wondered what on earth you're going to make with it? Have you ever wanted to make something a little bit crazy just to see how it'll turn out? Why not come with me on the journey of the camo bustle gown, a dress of wrong? Today I'm going to start doing the bodice to the amazing camo dress using the Trudy Victorian TV 460 bodice because I've used this one before and I can make it fit me pretty easily. I usually trace the pattern and I've made this before so I thought wait I don't have to trace the pattern again but unfortunately I can't find my tracing so I have to trace it again which means I can show you how I do. Okay slight delay there where I went and found my tracing paper because you know teenagers woe betide they should actually return something they borrowed. So I use this tracing paper, which is fabulous, it's really thick, as you can see, brilliantly see-through, really strong, easy to cut, last ages. It is, it comes in a red tube like that. I will put a link underneath for this because it's fantastic for draft for tracing patterns onto, I'm assuming, and also for drafting patterns onto because it just keeps for ages. It's not like tissue from the commercial pants. You can also press it if you're careful. Because this paper comes tightly rolled, I find I need to hold it open with pattern weights. Once the paper is nice and smooth, I simply trace the pattern using a pencil in the size that I've chosen. Use rulers and curves to make sure the lines are nice and smooth and fine. The paper pattern can then be cut out, marked up and labelled. Use first to make a toile. I'm using calico here, which is a similar weight to my final fabric. The toile is cut without sleeves in this case, as I don't feel I need to fit those. Simply pinned it together carefully, ensuring all the ease is there and then sewed. Quick twirl, try it on, come back with the alterations. Once the twirl was fitted, it didn't need too many alterations. Those I had were transferred to the pattern. And then the cutting out can begin. The idea of the camo bustle gown has been rattling around in my head for a while. I have no idea why. I got the fabric at a bargain price a few years ago and it's been sitting in my workroom waiting for its time. It's turned out to be a really nice fabric to work with. It's a lovely firm cotton. Great to cut and sew much more well behaved than many many prettier fabrics that I've used in the past. As a lining, I conscripted some cotton twill from Stash. This is tacked in place, basted for Americans, so it can be treated as one with the outer, which is known as flat lining. Then the bodice is simply sewn together. Pressed. And the lining edge is trimmed, ready to flat fell the seams to the bodice. <laughs> then I double checked the sources and realised I shouldn't have done that. So in my quest to learn more traditional period dressmaking techniques, I refer, like many people, to books. A lot of these books are available for free on places like archive.org. I really like to have a paper copy though. The two that I've been using most of all are Bertha Banner's Domestic Science Manuals Household Sewing with Home Dressmaking. This is just the cheapest reprint I could find. Um, a lot of basic seams and stitches. One of those books that at first glimpse you think, oh, and then you read it. It's just 
full of information of how things should be done and the other one I've used is Authentic Victorian Dressmaking Techniques which says edited, edited by Christina Harris this actually has photographs in which I find amazing this is about 1905 again the text is very dense but it's really worth reading through to find those little nuggets of how things were done and it makes even the modern pattern interpretations of period dress just make much more sense some of these other books I keep referring to Overcasting. So traditionally in Victorian garments, various ways of finishing the edges. Overcasting is really common. This is the point I realised I shouldn't have cut that under layer off. But you know what? It's too late. So I'm just going to go with it. So hopefully in a future video I will do this properly with both layers still the same length. I've realised this is why when you cut notches in the seam to make it curve, like you would in the modern, you just cut a slit. By cutting the notch on both ways, it means you can actually go around the edge to overcast. And the whole point of overcasting is to stop all this fraying from getting any worse. I tried it with polyester, didn't really like it. It's very slithery and this is a cotton. I found this rather sweet thing. I don't know if you can see it. This is an old cardboard reel of lovely cotton thread. 1,000 yards, 915 metres, which makes me think it's early 70s. Anyway, it works really well because it's much grippier than polyester. So to overcast, it really is deeply simple. All the books say eighth of an inch deep. They argue about how far apart stitches should be. But to be honest, this is just a working thing. My cheat, an eighth of an inch. Eighth of an inch on the thumb. It's sharpie, it'll come off. If you were into nail art, you could have eighth of an inch painted on or something by your so word person who does nail art. Manicurist? Is that what they're called? I don't know. I don't do nail art. Turns out I'm not really good at diagonal stitch, which is why I've had to cheat. And the idea is to time how long this takes as well. So this is sleeve. I've done two sleeves, cut them out, line them, cheated and done machine running stitch because the machine does it better than me. Flat felt the ends. And then I've got the arm band which goes around that bottom of the arm. This actually was way too big so I've taken it in but I've only taken it in on one side. I should really mark the other side so they're the same because my arms are fairly symmetrical. I'm feeling quite stressed by this project right now. I think it's a time thing. It's have taken ages. Right so that's my but what I want to do is gather this first. Gather it and fit it and see if it fits because this gathering is going to be bulky. So make sure it still goes on. So gathering it's fairly easy. I've actually done used two different colours so I can see what's going on. It's just a matter of pulling the two threads. Sure, it's really easy, she says. I hate gathering. I'd rather pleat, to be honest with you. If it ever wants to move, it's got to take it really slowly. I even put it on the right side. Sometimes I find one side pulls better than the other. That's where I find I've done it on too tight a thing. It won't gather. I'll just use one thread or something. I'm thinking I should have done this by hand. That's because it's really thick. Oh, there we go, that one's going. I have a horrible feeling the threads are going to snap. And this, dear viewers, is why you should do it by hand, because it would be a lot gentler. <sighs> and I've broken the thread. You know what? I'm going to do this again by hand. I'm going to unpick the machine sewing, sew it again by hand because that is so aggravating and stressful. And now I've broken the thread. Oh, now it comes out. Now it gathers. But you know what? We're going to forget this. Do it again by hand. Turned out it really didn't take very long to hand stitch the gathering stitches. hand gathering. The gathers are quite big because this fabric is quite thick. If it was a little fine silk or something, they wouldn't be so thick. So, oh, that's a lot easier. Look at that. That's way easier. It so, all oh, just needs to be gathered up. Oh, so much better. So there we go. Really easy gather. You can see the sleeve already starting to form. So it's going to be well puffy. Fit the cuff of the sleeve. First, the cuff is pinned on the flat underarm where there are no gathers. Make sure it's nice and secure. Mm 
and the gathering thread is pulled up and secured on a pin at either end one at the center top one at the bottom this means the gathers can be adjusted to be nice and smooth without the thread changing length gives you the time and freedom to get those gathers nice and neat and pin them all in place I find the more time you take pinning gathers the nicer they look I also decided to tack these gathers into place as I wanted to machine sew the cuff and machine sewing can be a little bit rough on gathers. In retrospect I might as well have hand sewed them but there we go. I have machine sewn that because it's not completely hand sewn and I didn't want to. would have botched that the new me is going to try and fix it i didn't catch the light the main piece in the gathering stitch oh well, there we go it's a lesson learned to fix it's simply a matter of unpicking the section pulling the escaped fold firmly back into place pinning it and restitching it so that's now Press that out, try to pass it now. Cut off all these extra threads. The bottom half inch of the cuff was folded over and pressed. And that then makes it easy to fold the whole cuff over the edge of the sleeve, pin it into place such that the machine sewn line is hidden. Taking care to do that makes a really neat finish. And then it's simply felled into place with teeny tiny felling stitches. Fan felling is one of those period techniques that it's really worth doing. And let's face it, it's often done in modern sewing as well. It just makes it really neat and strong. Time to insert the sleeve. Luckily with this, it's symmetrical sleeve, so it's not as hard. There's an asymmetrical one, it kind of doesn't matter which one, I've already done one. One trick for putting sleeves in, I find it really useful to mark the top of the sleeve and the top of the arm side with a pin. Bearing in mind the Victorian arm holes don't have the seam at the top, it's set back. Then those two points can be pinned. Then the centre bottom of the sleeve and arm side can be pinned. In this case there are two seams to match up which makes it nice and easy. I then pin the rest of the ungathered sections of the sleeve and then repeat the gathering system of the cuff, pinning the gathering thread at the top, pulling it tight, winding it around a pin, and that allows again the gathers to be adjusted nice and evenly and without stress and then all pinned together really firmly and sewed into place to make a beautiful sleeve I did it a bit about how to finish the edges of the bodice, but eventually I decided to continue the theme of the dress of wrong and opted for this rather fabulous rainbow tape. Attached in much the same manner as the cuff, 
machine sewn right sides together along the crease of the tape. It gives me a nice straight line. Folded such the tape is not visible from the outside. Pinned into place. The bias tape stretch helps with those curves. Watch the corner. I may add a patch to this because it's annoying me. Now I'm just hand sewing. Lots and lots of little felling stitches to hold it all in place. Felling is a very soothing kind of sewing. That's all done. And from the outside. The next thing is the arm skies. Now the book says authentic Victorian dressmaking techniques that this needs to be trimmed right down and then covered with a ribbon. So I'm going to trim it down and I'm just going to keep using this binding. It's very thin. So scary scary, trim this right down, cover the seam. So I really want to trim it pretty much. I don't want to trim too much off. A little bit, but not too much. And I think the point is when you cover the seam that you don't make a new seam, you just sew it to the edge. Of course, the book, you're supposed to sew this on while you make the arm sky, which I didn't do. So it's a little bit more work, so I'm going to have to hand stitch it on both sides, but it'll be fine. Big scissors, big cut. to actually unpick that. See, it's... don't like that. Right, fix that, come back. A quick unpick, adjust and re-sew, sorted out the problem, just like the previous one. The felling stitches seem to be easier, smaller, because if I try and go too wide, too long, then it's much trickier to stop them coming through to the front. Because obviously what you really don't want to do is have that come through, so that's there. There's no sign. Oh, actually there's a tiny sign of a needle there. See, that's too deep. I don't think you can see that, but the focus. Oh well. Anyway, it came through too much. I could feel that it had gone too deep. I just take a little stitch. And don't worry about making the stitch so long. It's actually quicker, weirdly enough. Not, to be honest, that it really matters under here. It's right under the arm and nobody's ever going to... Well, actually, it's on top of the arm, but nobody's ever going to notice the tiny little stitches right next to the seam. Except me, which is kind of the point, isn't it? So then just fold it over and stitch on the other side. added to the front by creating channels out of ribbon hand stitched to the seams and then adding plastic artificial whalebone which has been trimmed and smoothed. Victorian bodices really do need boning, it stops them wrinkling and riding up and keeps that beautiful curvy shape. Even though they're worn over a corset, boning makes a huge difference. Okay, final press, hopefully. Oh, still got to take all that stitching out. I'll do that in a sec. Now I've put the iron on a lower temperature now because although the fabric is cotton, the um, binding is, I don't know what, polyester or something. Oh, close the curves. That's the boning holding the curve up there. So the bodice is finished apart from the fastenings. Um, a bit tricky to film this, so I thought I'd just do it by hand. There we go, pretty rainbow insides. 
and seams and the other rainbow. Quite pleased with the finish. I've realised one big mistake, which I'm not going to fix because nothing is perfect. So I've done the bottom look here to line up. Oh, that's the back, it's the front here. Kind of a jackety buttony thing. But I've realised that once it's actually done up, it's going to overlap because that's how fastenings fasten. And that means I'm going to have this weird crossover thing going on. But you know what? Let's just have a weird crossover thing going on. So, fastenings, and that is done. I've got to the stage where I just want this done. There we go. When the whole dress is done, you'll get some nice pics of the whole thing. So I've got some dithering and design to do, but that's the complete dress of wrong fastening, hopefully. And I'm going to do it on the sewing machine just to completely blow it, because at this stage in the game, I'm putting nylon strapping with metal rings in a completely non-period, so now is time to use the sewing machine. I'm not going to learn anything from that, apart from that my hand sewing sucks. Okay, quick tricks. Apologies for the gross saucer, but it's a candle saucer and it was used for paint and stuff. Anyway, nylon strapping, easiest way to seal it. Let's just run it through a candle or a lighter, but to be honest, I find a candle safer because you don't burn your fingers. Uh, it saves so much hemming and edging and goodness knows what. Anything nylon can be melt sealed, including so things like chiffon, organza, you know, modern bought in a shop, and obviously silk can't. They make a horrible mess. And test it first because I have discovered that a few fabrics go a bit woomphy, but a lot of stuff just melts like that. Boom. In fact, whenever you cut nylon webbing, you're supposed to melt it. So let's just do the end so it doesn't disappear when we're cutting it. There we go. And then we want this to go from there. That's quite a lot longer, actually. Maybe that's the wrong end. That end. That's better. Oh, it's the wrong end. So that one's that length. That one's that length. That one's that length. 